Welcome to The Owl Hoot, a podcast for the environmentally curious, with me, Caroline Norbury. On each episode, I chat with a guest who contributes in some way to protecting the planet on matters of climate change, sustainability, biodiversity and pollution. Here is a place where you can gain new knowledge and be inspired. Enjoy listening. Here with me today on the podcast is Simon Tilly, a director at Hockton Housing Project, a small community of self-sufficient co-housing. As well as providing sustainable living to its residents, the organisation runs events, workshops, vocational training and offers a sustainability consultancy service. Simon has a background in mechanical engineering, lives in one of the five eco-houses and has been part of the project since its inception in 1995. I'm keen to discover the hallmarks of a sustainable home and Simon's experience of living within the Hockerton community. Welcome, Simon, to the podcast. Hi, Caroline. Good to meet you. And you. So um, it'd be great to hear a bit about your background, what you were actually doing before Hockerton and what led you to start up Hockerton Project. Well, it's an interesting story, really. So we, uh, my wife and I, were working in Namibia in Southern Africa with uh, voluntary service overseas. And when we came back from there, we really wanted to improve what we were doing here. It sounds strange, but we went there to help, in inverted commas, uh, one way or another. But we realised that actually what was causing most of the issues was uh, them importing our bad ways, basically. And so when we came back, we really wanted to improve how we live here and what we do and how we treat the natural environment and how we use resources. And we imagined, uh, we created a sort of an imaginary image in our mind of how we wanted to live and what it might look like. And we were super fortunate to find uh, a group of people who had uh, plans for something similar. Uh, So we joined this group and that's how we got into it. Uh, when you say you found people, how did you how did you find a collection of people that had a very similar view of life and had the same sort of objectives as, as to how they wanted to live that life? Uh, well, at the time, obviously, the Internet wasn't quite. So this was back in 1995 and we were just uh, going around and we, we went to a, a green fair and this group had a stall. They were actually talking about composting, but on the side they had a, a model that they'd made of the houses they wanted to build and what they might look like. And we got chatting. We we turned up on our bikes and they had bikes and that was a common ground. And, and then we realised that the project they were describing was actually so close to what we'd imagined uh, that, uh, yeah, we just wanted to find out more and got involved that way. Wow, that, that sounds uh, very serendipitous to... Uh, yes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you make your own luck. You make your own luck. You have to go to the... Re- you have to force the issue, I think, in some ways. It's strange. You, things happen if you start pushing in the right direction. Yeah, and I think it's it's one thing to have an idea of what your life might be like. It's another to... I mean, you have... Uh, shown through the project, uh, which I'm going to get you to describe in a minute, uh, that, that obviously you, you need more than just an idea. So tell me about uh, what went in to actually getting the project up and running uh, and how you made these uh, sustainable homes. Uh, interestingly, key, I think it's key is the um, the soft things, really. It's it's actually the group of people and having and, and utilising the different skills that different people have. So we were five families and so a small team if you like that wanted to do this and there's a lot of different skill sets within that many people so there was 10 adults and children as well and it's it's getting the best out of people and pulling together to do a difficult project and it was difficult at the time because it was not only was it fairly unusual perhaps to be thinking about sustainability as deeply and as broadly as we were at the time but it was also a fairly radical design that we were trying to build and establish so it was quite risky uh, and we we needed to have quite a lot of faith that it was going to work I suppose and so having a a tight-knit team that kind of 
wanted it to succeed was really important. And that having that faith, how uh, quickly did you get an idea of, oh, this is going to work? I mean, because obviously you started with uh, just a piece of land, didn't you? Uh, so you literally yeah. build these homes from scratch. When did you know it was going to work? Well, we probably didn't know for sure until we moved in. But uh, the um, there, there was a single house. So our house, there's a group of five houses we've built. There was a single house built uh, immediately before, which Nick Martin, one of the members here, had been involved in building. And so that was kind of up and running and, and working. So we knew the principles were were good. So we were we were confident, I suppose, in that way, although it hadn't been done in the same uh, what would you say format as we've we've done here but we were using the same principles of how the house might work and and that re- and that principle was really thinking about a house as part of a system as opposed to a box that you live in so the system being where does the light come from and where does it go where does the heat come from and where does it go and how does the water get in and where does the water come from and and all those sort of flows in and out of a house that are typically just bolt on things afterwards and people sort of assume that you just plug it in and off it'll go but we were considering those as part of the environment and how we plugged into that those cycles within the environment. And what are the key features of the houses that make them sustainable? We have um, built with the idea that we have low impact as far as we can, but balancing that with the financial side and the social side. So when I talk about this, it's it's always important to remember to talk about the things that are more difficult to um uh, visualize so like how we made the decisions as a group but in terms of the actual sort of physical bit of it the houses are uh, autonomous so you have to really consider energy use so autonomous meaning that you're, you're using the local resources to meet your needs and and we haven't achieved that in every area but so we, we, we've got very low energy use from the design and then we're meeting those energy needs from the sunshine mostly and the wind and things like that we we have very low water use needs and that enables us to collect rain and use that uh, to meet our water needs in the house and then that dirty water is treated by a system on site before we let it go back into the river sort of thing so that there's things like that it's uh there's lots in fact so not just energy and water but lots of other elements that go into making it more sustainable and going on to the heating, I understand you don't have any sort of typical type of heating system within the houses. Uh, you are literally using external, as you say, wind and solar. Uh, how does that work? Because you've, I think you've got solar panels now, but that wasn't always the case. Yeah, so the the solar panels that you think of and see on people's houses are just icing on the cake. We started with the, the key bit. So most people don't realise uh, that most of the energy in a house is for heating. It's not electricity. It's mostly heat. And, and sadly, that seems to be forgotten all over the place. But recognising that, often up to two thirds of the energy is for heating. And so we focused on that first. And we found, I think it's still amazing, but we found that with enough insulation around a house, the passive energy gains, so what I mean by that is right through the windows, and body heat, for instance, are sufficient heat sources to keep the house warm. And that's what we have here. Uh, so, and that's with, as I said, we've got body heat in there. So that's with normal, in inverted commas, occupancy. So the houses are designed for a certain number of people. Uh, if you don't have that number of people in them, because you haven't got the body heat, you might have to add in a bit of extra heating, but it's not very much. It's like replacing bodies, sure. <laughs> which don't give you a huge amount. But it is amazing. It's still amazing to me that um, those little those little gains from body heat and even a cat, even a cat, 15 wow. watts from a cat um, can make uh, a difference. And so but uh, th- there's one technical aspect other than just sort of insulate it, stop the heat escaping is storing heat. 
So typically with renewable energy, and that's what we're using uh, there, is is the sun quite a lot to keep the houses warm, is that it's not there all the time, as we know, you know, it's daylight one minute and then it's night time. And so you lose that. And in the summer, the days are much longer. In the winter, the days are much shorter. And and yet we've got to figure out a way to use that energy to keep the house warm consistently through the night and through the winter. And to achieve that, we store heat and that heat is then released when the sunshine isn't there. So that's our big, if you like, that's our unique selling point, as they say. But if you think about Passive House and lots of other eco houses that have been around, they often don't do that bit, the storage of heat. And that what's that makes us different. Uh, how are you storing the heat? The, it's very simple, actually. Uh, it's putting the mass of the building, so the bricks and the mortar, on the inside of the insulation. So if you think about a typical house that you see being built on the side of the road, sort of a wimpy home or a barracks home or something, you'll see timber frame going up and they insulate in the timber frame and they have a brick outside and you see the bricks on the outside. So that is exactly the opposite of what we do. So they've got the bricks, the thermal mass on the outside of the building and most of the insulation or all of the insulation effectively on the inside with maybe a bit of plasterboard on the inside of that, but it's very, very thin, in, uh, if you like, compared to the bricks. Whereas we do it the other way around. So we've got the insulation on the outside and the structure of the building on the inside, so the, the floor and the walls and so on. And that then enables you to store heat in the walls. So we're not actually using any extra materials, we're just putting them in a different place. And so that's, <laughs> so it's, it's all about clever design being sustainable. And that's that's what we've done. So it's just switching round where the mass is. OK, I'm, I'm super impressed. But why why is everyone else not doing the same then? <laughs> why are commercial builders not replicating what seems? An yes, so that, that is a big question. And I wish I really knew the answer. I, I can guess because obviously I can't speak for them. But fundamentally, I think we have there's two things. There's very little connection between people that build houses and people that live in them. So you have a new housing estate and they're up for sale. You, the people that buy those new houses have not had one iota of input into the construction. So the feedback loop between people. So the builders don't pay the heating bills, put simply. And, and so they don't give there's no connection there between people going, oh, I want, you know. And the other thing uh, is that at the moment. You can build anything and sell it. You know, we have a huge demand for houses and a very limited supply. So builders do not want to risk change. So fundamentally, they can make money out of building what they've always built. Wow. So why bother changing? And so it's a structural economic thing that, you know, unless they're, you know, forced into it by the building regs or whatever, some, some you know, community-based system of we have to build these things better whether that's the government diktat or whatever but they don't change so there's no there's no force for change in the building industry basically because the customer doesn't relate to the builder and the builder can sell anything because there's such a high demand for buildings that is so mind-blowingly curious <laughs> <laughs> i know that's my take on it i could be wrong but that's yeah, how yeah. i see what you know because i've been trying to promote these houses and low energy houses for a long time no, 20 whenever that is 95 so it gets longer and longer that's the sad thing 26 years <laughs> uh, and you know we have had there are lots of people building better houses now which is great but not the vast majority of the bulk of houses and it's so sad to see that oh you know we are currently building houses that according to the government's targets of zero carbon by you know 2040 or whatever or even 50% reduction in carbon by whenever it is 2030 or whatever. We know that those houses are all going to be retrofitted. You know, the ones we're currently building, we know are going to be taken apart and put back together again in to get to zero carbon. It's absolutely bonkers. And there doesn't seem to be joined up. Nobody's joined up the dots. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's bonkers. Hard to imagine, particularly at a time when 
the environment and climate change is much more out there and being talked about but we're just behind the curve it would seem are you sensing that is changing because you know, for example, having COP26 last year, has it had any impact on or pressure being put on the building industry? It's difficult to say. So there are builders out there trying to tackle it, which is really good. Uh, and often, though, they're, the, they're kind of the smaller, innovative builders that are trying to get that niche market, if you like, going, well, we can supply this much better house Uh and, and finding the people to buy it. Sadly, people are, are, it's very difficult when you're buying a house because the supply of eco houses, if you like, is so limited to, you know, it's, as ever, it's more about where's the local school and, and, you know, where's my job? And you then have to go with what's around you in terms of the house. You can't go and live in Hockerton if you've got a job in Coventry, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So, it's still very piecemeal and building regs, they're still very weak. And the, I mean, the government a while ago reduced the requirements to get more houses built. You know, the, the big builders went, oh, we can't meet all these horrible restrictions on losing heat. And well, well, we've got to have leaky houses because they're cheap to build. And the government went, oh, OK. <laughs> I mean, how bonkers is that? Yes. Yes, super frustrating. So in terms of, obviously, you've managed the, to get this very sustainable in terms of heating. What sort of temperature are you actually living in? So in the winter, it does go down to about 18 degrees in the house. Uh, and then in the summer, it goes up to about 23. But it's a very even, Stephen, change. It's, it's, so day and night doesn't change by more than about 0.1 of a degree. But uh, over the whole six months, it'll go from the 23 down to the 18, which is, you know, you might have to have a jumper on uh, when you're sitting down. And uh, that's but it I will. It is interesting. It's a different sort of a heat. Now, I know that sounds funny, but because the mass of the building, as I described, is on the inside and we don't have radiators. So in a typical house, you have cold windows, cold walls and a radiator at 70 degrees. So one part of the room is feels really hot and you're feeling this intense radiant heat coming off that heater. And then over by the window, you might have got a bit of a draft and you've got cool on the side of your face. And, you know, it's much cooler there. Whereas our this is different. It has a different feel. So the whole building is at 18 degrees the inside of the building. So it radiates that at you all round. And there isn't a hot spot and a cold spot. So it's more like living in a Mediterranean house where it's kind of warm all the time. Um, so the feel is different in the house, which is very difficult to describe, but you have to come and feel it. But the so that that's uh, and if you wanted it warmer or you've got, you know, you haven't got so many children living at home anymore. And so the house has only got one or two people in it and it was designed for four, then you might do. So what we did when the children left home, we started cooking more bread. Wow, cool. <laughs> Your children replaced <laughs> by bread. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sufficient. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, it's odd, those little things you think about. Now, we haven't actually changed the total energy consumption. It was being made, bread was being made in a factory somewhere, and now we're making it in the house. We've just moved where the energy is. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It's so interesting to hear you say what it feels like to live in a, a a house where the temperature is even throughout that is perhaps something that people won't uh, you know have immediately thought about so you've got this very pleasant living space and you mentioned the water so you're not on the mains do you get all the water you possibly need from rainfall yep yep so i mean it's a relatively minor part of our impact but it's still important and in terms of, you know, addressing climate change, it's a minor part, but in terms of almost in terms of the psychology, it's really important. So we succeeded in building, being completely off the water mains. Uh, so we collect rainwater, we store it, we use it and we put it and that's been really successful. And it's we're really good with that. And, and part of it is because you can see the reservoir that we have, which holds the water and 
it's a very short feedback loop. You know, if that reservoir is full, we have no worries about water. You know, it's full. If it's, you know, half full, we're then obviously concerned because we know we've got much less water. So we might adjust our behavior. We might not use quite so much water and so on. Fortunately, it's never gone below about a third down. <laughs> so in effect, we have a lot of rain here and it spreads itself across the year. So it's relatively easy to be autonomous in water, we've found. Uh, but the, the important thing is the feedback being part of that system. And it makes you consider how you're integrating into the environment much more closely. With energy, you know, with electric lights and electricity, and even with heat, it's actually quite difficult because you physically can't see electricity or heat. You know, it's, it's a different thing. And even if you had batteries, you know, you, the battery looks the same, whether it's full or empty. You have to, it's a bit more tenuous. And so electricity and energy is a little bit more difficult to get your head around when it comes to just adjusting behaviour. That is a really interesting point that you've made about getting people to buy in if they can imagine it, if they can see it, which obviously is, is, as you say, more difficult. Whereas water, once you kind of tune into your water use, you're kind of thinking about how long you're leaving a tap on, what can I do with the residu residual water that's in the bo mm. uh, bottom of the bath, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas it's, it's, as you say, it's it's really interesting that it's not quite as easy to tap into that. So uh, you ha you don't need much external sources of energy for your heating. But what about the other, like you mentioned there, the lights and, and running your computers and what have you? Yeah. So the key thing is conservation, reducing energy consumption in heating first, and then in lights. So you know things like we were putting in compact fluorescence 25 years ago and that was a big thing because they were expensive but now we're you know they they last about 15 years and we're replacing them all with leds which is great so you know led lights are just super easy to put in they this one i've got here is at least twice as much light as the old fluorescent tube and is half the energy so you know brilliant even better than when we started so you know thinking about energy consumption is absolutely key and relatively simple things you can have quite big impacts uh, on your energy use mostly around though you know it doesn't matter how energy efficient this light is above my head but it's really really important to turn it off when you walk out of the room yeah. <laughs> you know that's where you save most energy yeah. <laughs> turning it. things off when you don't want them we don't need them and so yeah so uh, but all that energy we try and produce on site now uh, we, we're doing the electricity from a combination of uh, wind power and photovoltaic panels and so photovoltaics pv panels um, making electricity and we generate well that's an interesting story so we are actually grid connected so uh, we, unlike the water system we couldn't store electricity and i think interestingly that well, you can store it, but it's just super expensive. And so we decided not to uh, at the beginning. And we've we've uh, so we're, we're connected to the mains electricity. And we're, so when it's sunny in the day and we're making electricity and we're not using it because we're all out at work. Uh, and then at night time we are using electricity. We import it. So we have we have that to and froing. Our aim is to produce as much as we are consuming, uh, which which we're pretty much there except now for the fact that we've got four electric cars on site <laughs> and so the electric cars are now obviously using electric we charge them up here and so we're trying to expand the uh, electrical production more photovoltaic panels probably um to try and help meet the car charging needs right does that mean that you actually have space on more space on your roof that you could put more pv panels on no so that, this is a challenge for us we're actually struggling now because every bit of inch of roof space <laughs> we've used so we're looking round at ways of uh you know considering what we want to do with the lamb which is grow food not using up the lamb but still getting more energy out of it electrically as well so we're looking for niche bits which are too steep or 
uh, aren't productive and using those or or the, the walls, the vertical bits and um, all sorts of things which uh, you can start sort of really drilling down to. But the, the first place to start, of course, is the roof. But um, yeah, we've already covered the roofs. And because you've been going for quite some time, uh, I imagine obviously at the beginning you you're putting all the infrastructure in, you're setting it up to go. But it sounds like over time you've added parts uh, that it's, it's still developed. Is that because the needs have changed, and as you know, like having electric cars now requiring more electricity? Or is it that, oh, we could have done this in the beginning or we didn't have the tech? What were the reasons for perhaps change over the years? I think it's funding, really. You know, we were just a group of five people and we had enough money to build the houses and then we ran out and then we built our community building about six years later and the you know the renewable energies cost money and and it's just a case of over time we can afford to do it partly and then and then there's the you know well there weren't really electric cars we did have an electric car in 1995 <laughs> an wow. fso which is a russian a little russian model um back in 1995 and then we had an electric Peugeot 106 but it's only in the last ah, two or three years that they've actually become much more mainstream isn't it and and so we've we've got we've able to get more so it's some of it's been about the technology and and certainly the technology has changed for the electrical things so much more efficient photovoltaic panels for instance much much better but some of the other things we're, we're looking at, you know, when we moved in, it was very we were thinking about sustainability. So all the aspects and climate change and carbon impacts were we understood to be an issue, but they have become much more, uh, you know, highlighted that we have really changed and, and the amount of carbon is having so much more effect. You know, when I was born. The carbon impact was pretty small. If you look at the graphs back in 1965, when I was born, there wasn't actually that it, that was an issue, but it was a long way off. And it, but because it's an exponential curve, this carbon impact that we're having, you know, at the moment, the 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 increase is phenomenal. And the you know, that's things everybody needs to understand is the increase is still increasing We we a seven percent reduction we heard at covid on average but that's a seven percent reduction on the increase 93 percent is still going in <laughs> it wasn't a, an actual decrease in the carbon in the atmosphere <laughs> yeah. it was an increase yeah. it just was increasing slightly less <laughs> it, it's important to reveal the data in a way that's actually meaningful rather than saying it's oh it's okay we've, we've done a good job that year <laughs> yes exactly and so uh, that has become more of a that's changed so our focus is on uh carbon reduction and trying to promote that carbon reduction uh and that is actually really difficult it is really difficult thinking because we've got we don't want to be where we are uh, and any carbon put into the atmosphere now is is a really bad thing and so it's very hard you know we've come quite a long way in 25 years and understood what we need to do but some people haven't really clocked yet the enormity of what we've got to do and the learning curve for a lot of people is going to be extremely steep which is yeah. going to be really yeah. difficult do you find because you open your site up to visitors um, and people can come to you for consultancy services, are, uh, is, it a, is that a way of voicing the change that needs to be required? Are people coming because they want to know how to do things? Yeah, that's really interesting because it used to be, oh, that's a bit quirky. What? You live underground. No, I haven't talked about that yet, have I? But or, you know, you've got a wind turbine and, and uh, you collect, oh, odd scratch head go and have a look at that now it is much more about what you just said which is oh we're, we're trying to do something different and can you help what what did you do can we learn how are we going to do it so that has changed which is really good to see that there's definitely more and more people wanting to do things differently and and get it right so that's good 
So you touched upon, perhaps we ought to mention the earth bit about your housing. <laughs> yes. So, yes, the earth bit hasn't popped up, has it? But uh, it is interesting that the uh, one of the impacts, obviously, you have in housing is what it looks like. And so although uh, it often almost detracts from the energy conservation side of our project, the earth sheltering is there. We're, we're living in the countryside and we've we've built the back of the houses and around the sides of the houses uh, under underground. And that means, you know, the view, if you like, is just of earth and grass and trees and things. So they're very really difficult to see the houses. And that's sort of the vision impact, which in terms of carbon saving, it does have some big advantages, but it's kind of not the the thing that saves the most carbon. I mean, it saves carbon. So I'll give you a few examples of how, how does earth roof save carbon? Well, you're not making clay tiles. So lots of roofs have clay tiles. Those clay tiles have to be put, you know, the clay is put in an oven. It's baked at a thousand degrees or something and then carted on a lorry. So there's lots of carbon going into that process. Whereas we had earth on the ground. We moved it to one side. We built the house and we put the earth back on top. So very low carbon intensity for the roof covering. So that's that's one way on the capital. The second way on the sort of the running is that the outside of the house has this buffer zone, if you like, of the earth. So rather than seeing wind and rain and minus whatever degrees in the winter, the soil doesn't fall below much below 10 degrees. So the outside of the house is in a much more cosy environment. So on an ongoing basis, the energy flow out of the house is is much less because of the the earth sheltering um so it does have ongoing energy conservation measures as well but it's actually a relatively small part so i i, I want to emphasize that because you know in town in high density developments you're probably not going to be earth sheltering but it's not the end of the world you can still do all the energy conservation <laughs> I think that's it's it's good to highlight that that it doesn't have to look exactly like your your housing project, but people could still take all the important key elements of what's made it sustainable and appropriate it to the towns or wherever uh, a new building society is going up. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. Before I get on for the last couple of questions, I just wanted to know what it's like living in a community of like-minded people, all because you kind of. Uh, I don't mean you live together, but you you work the land together. You you share resources. What's that been like? We thought originally we would be getting away from administration and paperwork and reducing all that side of life. But in fact, it turns out that when you live uh, and try and do stuff with other families, you invent your own paperwork. <laughs> so we 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 are there's five separate houses, but we do share some stuff. So we share looking after, we share growing food, looking after the trees we have our own water system so we have to look after that together and so you know who's changed the filters when were they changed you have to record it and, and you know have to know who's done it and so actually that all in a funny way so we have we get together we still get together three evenings a month um it used to be four evenings a month but uh, so three times a month we're about, about once every so three weeks in four we uh we get together and, and decide, you know, all that kind of stuff. What we're going to grow this year, what worked last year, what didn't work, who's going to change the filters, all that kind of day-to-day -day living stuff. But that facilitates community. You know, people often ask, oh, do you get on with your neighbours? Well, not all the time, no. But we get on sufficiently well to work together and have a few parties together and just create community really do stuff and because of the nature of these houses where we are actually autonomous houses in the fact that you know our family is separate from next door's family we actually over only overlap a bit so you can get away from the group very easily back into your house and your family but if you want to be part of the community it's very easy too because they're just the neighbors and we have a a plan at the weekend to you know clear out the fallen tree in the dumble and we'll do that together and that and so there's that kind of um so once you have to do some things as community like who's going to change the water filter 
you can't help yourself but go oh but we could grow some beans <laughs> yeah no I like that because it um it shares what it is to be a, a slightly we all know what it's like to live in a family you don't always get it on all of the time and it and you, and it's a similar thing from what you're saying to a slightly bigger community you're there for each other but at the same time you're not going to agree on everything that's that's normal that's normal life isn't it um yes. so to, to come to the last couple of questions and i wonder as you've been in this place for quite some time what your view will be of 2050 where will we have stepped up and <laughs> gone forward in terms mm. of housing what will it look like simon give me a nice picture <laughs> well on the uh, on when i have my optimistic head on we will tackle this uh, i suspect it's going to be quite challenging and in 2050 yeah we will be building houses certainly with loads more insulation around them than we currently build and uh, certainly with much better draft stripping and we'll have ventilation that works properly um, with heat recovery and we'll all have photovoltaic panels on the roof generating our own energy so the the fuel bills will be zero or or maybe even positive in that you'll be selling electricity to to factories um, we'll all have electric bicycles and shops close by and maybe occasionally have an electric car ride but we'll be much more local and have more community and so it'll be really positive i think that's the that's the way we're going to get there is build a positive uh, future image of how it can all work and we'll have locally grown food and there'll be plenty of jobs because growing food is actually quite time consuming and we'll have a simpler life though so we won't be flying in airplanes very much we might have the odd hot air balloon ride uh, <laughs> which will be great and it'll be slow and we'll recognize how far away places are and we'll have schools that are local and we'll have really good universities that you'll still go away to and learn about stuff uh, but the our traveling will be less I think uh, but it'll be much more energetic and active so you'll be on your electric bike but you can do 50 miles on your electric bike no problem and so it won't be that restrictive and I suppose we might have got our act together in terms of how we make decisions. So I think how we as society tackle these big, hard decisions that we're going to have to make will be different. And we're going to have to work at how we make decisions quite a lot to, to achieve where we need to go. So that's, you know, the, the social side will be different. How we live in the environment will be different. But I think it'll be positive. We'll be more engaged and connected with the environment. That sounds positive. I, I like where you finish that as well. The fact that we'll be connected to it, because I think people do want to protect the things that they become connected to. So that sounds yeah, it sounds like a good vision. I like that, Simon. Thank you. And and finally, I always end asking my guest about what changes they've made in their life in terms of sustainability. Well, you obviously embraced that for the last 20 plus years. Um, so I, a slight twist on my normal ending would be you live sustainably already. I wonder what you have found to be the most useful thing that you've done that's sustainable or what you're looking forward to something else that might in the future be sustainable to you where where are you at with that are you doing something that you're really oh, the most useful of? things i suppose growing food is great it's simple it's productive that's the most useful without any doubt uh our energy system our joy of eating and growing is great i'm a mechanical engineer so actually what i've really enjoyed almost as much as that is my new electric bike I definitely recommend anybody to just have a go on an electric bike and without fail, I can guarantee you're going to smile. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you'll press the pedal, you'll cycle about two metres and you'll be smiling. <laughs> wow. Well, I live in Derbyshire and there are quite a few hills. Uh, I've yet to experience an electric bike, but that definitely sounds tempting. <laughs> yeah, the, hell, the hills disappear. It is absolutely wonderful. Great. On, on a very positive note, everyone get an electric bike um, or, or rent an electric bike. Thank you so much, Simon. It's been really, 
really terrific hearing about your sustainable story. So thank you. Okay, no worries, good to speak. Thanks to Simon for giving us a window into his world and the Hockerton housing project. How amazing would it be to live in a house where you don't need a central heating system? I found Simon's revelation about the consistency of the internal temperature to be particularly fascinating. I tried to imagine what it would be like to live in a house where you went from one room to another and didn't feel a change in temperature. And right now, wouldn't it be lovely not to have increasing energy bills? It seems houses can be built differently and Hockerton is certainly proof of this. Check out the link to the project for more information. I'd like to thank Andy Shaw for audio editing, Jeremy Jones for providing music, and to you of course for listening. Don't forget you can subscribe to get automatic access to each new episode. And it would be lovely if you could rate, review and share the podcast too. It really helps. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>